Yeah, greetings all and welcome back to PSCM TV. And this week we have the honor of Elder Cecil. Being the first Sunday in each month, he's here with us. And today he'll be looking at the topic of um, topic entitled The Changing Same of European Racism. So I'm looking forward to that because it sounds very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. So before we do this as normal, we'll go over to Ndugwe Marni, who will be changing the energy for us. So I'll hand you over now to Ndugwe Marni. Uh, Santi Sana Ndugwe, Santi Sana. Mm -hmm. Shukamar, MZ Cecil, um, and thank you all for joining us. Um, and as you said, my name is Ndugwe Marni, a member of Pan-African Congress Movement, and I'll be running us through this ritual that we do called Mabadilika Nishati, which is to change the energy in Kiswahili. We use Kiswahili as at the Sixth, Af Sixth Pan African Congress. He said that when there is a United States of Africa, the lingua franca of that of that state of that entity should be Kiswahili, because it's spoken so widely across the the African the African continent by millions of people, and so the Pan African Congress movement has adopted that. Okay. So it's uh, my honor to go for this ritual. It's a very special time that we're going through now because um, from yesterday it was the full moon. So this is a particular uh, uh, spiritual uh, energy that is in the, in the cosmos regarding manifestation, a manifestation of our wishes and our, our intentions. Yeah, so we can reveal that which we are able to reveal through our connection to universal consciousness. So in that, with that in mind, let me share the screen. Okay. Is that there now, Ndugu? Yeah, yeah, that's up now. Wonderful, okay. So, Mabadilika Yani Shati. So um, you'll see things here on the screen so you can follow. Uh, it's in Kiswahili and in Kemetic terms, but the translations are in English, so you can follow if you wish to. But if you don't wish to, that's absolutely fine. Uh, African spirituality is about is not about coercion. It's about love and about growth to, together and our, and, our, and our understanding. Okay, so before I begin, in MZ Sessa, hopefully you can still hear me. Do I have your... Um, permission to continue. Yes, my brother, please continue. Uh, Santisana. Okay. So, before, as we as we're going to start, we're going to start with bringing ourselves in more centered and become more calm and more in line with our spirit. And the way we're going to do that is with our breath, because our breath is that link between our physical entity or realm and our spiritual realm. Uh, entity or realm it's that bridge between the two so but you know breath is life so in order to do that we're just going to breathe together breathe deeply together and to calm ourselves and to center ourselves so if you wish to join me please do we're going to breathe together four times four is the spiritual number for growth health and abundance and foundation it's a very strong number for that four areas to a, a house to a square it's a found a very strong foundational and uh, 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 number so what we're going to do is if you can sit straight in whatever chair you are in if you're not on the sofa or on the bed back straight so your spine is straight so your energy centers the seven energy centers are in line Feet flat on the floor, hands on the palms of your hands on the palm of your hands on your thighs. And we're going to breathe out first of all. When we do breathe out, we pull our stomachs in to expel the air fully from our lungs. And then we relax our stomachs and that will bring in the air through our noses. And that will be one cycle. And I'll lead in counting Swahili. So if we can do that all together, those who wish to participate. So we breathe out. And now we relax and breathe in. Moja. We breathe out. And 
And then we relax and breathe in. In breathing, we started to feel more calm, feel the clearing air coming into our lungs. Breathe out. Hold it and now relax, breathe in. And Tartu, and now breathe out. Final time. Hold it and relax and breathe in. In there. And it's very important that we uh, breathe like that, try and breathe like that all the time. It's, it takes a little practice, but that helps us to be calm, to be centered, to be focused, especially in this time with the disease and we're wearing masks. It's not good for us to continue to breathe, you know, shallowly through, through coverings over our faces, as um, MZ uh, Baina Bello is often reminds us about breath and how we must breathe properly if we're ever using those masks when we take them off it. But it's also, you know, breathing like that keeps us dark, that we have a closer connection with them and they assist us in manifesting our objectives. And in order to do that, we're going to ring the chime three times, this triangle chime three times, three spiritual number for coming into being. Okay, and it's for creativity. creativity. So I'm gonna ring it three times, continue to breathe deeply, loud the chime, to go around you, over you, and through you. And that changes the energy and the vibration where you are, so you become in resonance, in to sync with the energy where you are. That opens up your consciousness to the universal consciousness, and we can join together, wherever we may be in the world, together in one accord through that, that change in that vibration. So I'll begin, I'll count, and just continue to breathe deeply. Well, Tata. Now to continue. So this kind of the call and response part of the of the ritual and in Dugu Tahaka you can do you can do it with it. We can do it in, in turns as we've done before. Oh, so caught me. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> it caught me unaware the last time because I wasn't practicing. Right. Right, so okay. You comfortable with that in Dugu, yes? Well if I get some of the pronunciation of it because I'm gonna practice it. That, that's that's fine. As long as we're set as long as we're saying it, that's that's the main thing. There's, there's the, the the spirit and the ancestors don't mind as long as we're trying. So I'll begin and what we're going to say together is Sisini Kitu Kimoja. Sisini Kitu Kimoja. And that means we are one or we are the same thing. So saying something very powerful regarding these energies that we're calling upon. We start with the first ancestor, the all, the creator. So, Nina Omba, Yamu Omba, Awote. Sisini, Kitu, Kimoja. And this one here, Indigo? Yeah, Nina Omba, Yamu. Nebacha. Nebacha. Sisini, Kitu, Kimoja. Excellent. Nina Omba, Kanuni, Nanguvu, Ya, Mamiwata. I'll leave that on the screen for a second so people can read that. Sisini Kitu Kimoja. Ndugu. Okay. Nenaomba Kanuni Ya Love. Nguvu Ya. Nguvu Ya. Shu. Okay. Okay. Shu. Mm hmm. Excellent. Sisini Kitu Kimoja. Ninaomba kanuni na nguvu ya tefnat. Sisini kitu kimoja. Right, and do Ninaomba kanuni ya nguvu ya not. Sisini kitu kimoja. 
And now we go on to the Pout Netaru, which is over here, the Kemetic Tree of Life, the Kemetic Aspects of the All. This is a spiritual science for our development of ourselves by calling on the powers that are and underpin all reality and existence, but also within our own psyches. Ninamba Kanunina and Guvu Ya Geb Sisini Kitu Kimoja. Dugu Ninamba Ninamba Oset. Excellent. Sisini Kitu Kimoja. Ninamba Kanunina and Guvu Ya Sebek. Sisini Kitu Kimoja. Ninaamba Kun oops, that's right. You Indigo. Ninaamba Kanuni ya heteru. Sisini Kitu Kimoja. Ninaamba Kanuni na Guvu ya Haru. Sisini Kitu Kimoja. Ndugu? Ninaomba kanuni ya heto? Herakuti. Herakuti. Sisi ni kitu kimoja. Ninaomba kanuni na nguvu ya maat. Just leave it on the screen for a second. So we can read that. Sisi ni kitu kimoja. Ndugu, so Nina Omba Kanuni na Nguvu ya. Yeah, Nina Omba Kanuni na Nguvu ya Sake. Excellent. Sisini Kitu Kimoja. Nina Omba Kanuni na Nguvu ya Tehuti. Sisini Kitu Kimoja. Okay, and Yeah, Nina Umba Kanuni Ya Um Ose Osa. Mm-hmm. Sisini Kitu Kimoja. Nina Umba Kanuni na Nguvu Ya Amen. Sisini Kitu Kimoja. Okay. And now we can call upon those ancestors who are in our direct bloodline. So I'll begin. Nina Amba, Audrey May Kelly. Sisini Kitu Kimoja. Ndugu? Yeah, Nina Amba, Iceland, Rettig. Sisini Kitu Kimoja. Anyone? Oh, Ndugu, you wish to call anybody else? Okay, Nina Amba, Kanuni, uh, Louise Hines. And Nina Amba, Kanuni, uh, Sylvester Rettig. Sisini Kitu Kimoja. Oh, one more. Nina Amba. Bibi Ketara Reed. Sisini Kitu Kimoja. Okay. And anyone else in Dugu before we move on? Yeah. Okay. So now we can call upon those ancestors that are not in our direct bloodline but have given their blood, their time, their effort and their lives for our families, for our communities, and for our nations and our race. I'll begin. Ninamba MZ, the Honorable Marcus Mazar Garvey. Sisini Kitu Kimoja. Ninamba Kanunia Santua. Sisini Kitu Kimoja. Ninaamba was a Amy Ashwood Garvey, now Amy Jacques Garvey. Sisini Kitu Kimoja. Yeah, Ninaamba Kanuni Shaka Zulu. Sisini Kitu Kimoja. Ninaamba MZ Nanabosu. Sisini Kitu Kimoja. 
Sisini Kitu Kimoja. Ninamba Baba Barenge. Sisini Kitu Kimoja. Ninamba Baba Dogi. Sisini Kitu Kimoja. Ninamba Dada Jan. Sisini Kitu Kimoja. Okay, so Nina Omba, MZ, Steve Biko. Sisini Kitu Kimoja. Can you ask? Okay, Nina Omba, MZ, Winnie Mandela. Sisini Kitu Kimoja. And now we can call upon those ancestors who we don't always know those names, but those, first of all, that we should never forget. Nina Omba, Mababuya, Mangamazi Sisini Kitu Kimoja Ninamba Babuya Gulavita, those who fought in the Gula Wars Sisini Kitu Kimoja Ninamba Babuya Asian Revolution Sisini Kitu Kimoja Ninamba Mababaya Ma Taifa Ya Kemet Na Taseti Na Kush Na Nubia Sisini Kitu Kimoja Ninamba Mababaya San Na Twa Na Hutu Sisini Kitu Kimoja Nina Waomba Wanaishi Ambao Watatate Sisi Nawali Ambao Bada Hawajazaliwa Sisi ni Kitu Kimoja. Now we end on the words of power and affirmation. So just repeat after me. Nguva Zote. Nguva Zote. Kwa watu wetu. Kwa watu wetu. Na mapenzi ya wote. Na mapenzi ya wote. Ni mapenzi yetu. Ni mapenzi yetu. Asante ni sana, Jamal. Thank you very much, Kindred. Okay. So now, um, as uh, we'll hand you over to Elder Cecil who will be doing the pleasure of presenting today's topic. And again, the topic is changing, the changing same of Euro racism. So now I hand over to Elder Cecil. Thank you, my brothers. Uh, thank you, uh, Brother Chair. Um, it's obvious, isn't it, that I'm possibly trying a thing with this uh, topic. As they might, as we might say in Jamaica, um, and that maybe is is why uh, the topic got notified slightly wrongly, um, where it said changing the name of uh, anti-black racism since the Second World War. So the the correct topic has now been given, and it's the changing sameness of European racism uh, since. The Second World War, since the Holocaust, in fact, and um, I, what I want to do is draw attention to something that I think is important and that tends to be neglected, and the neglect of it has consequences. Um, the alternative title, or an alternative title, might be "White Racism Since or After Hitler," and there's actually a book. Uh, almost by that title called Race After Hitler. But in fact, it's not about my topic at all. It's, it's a story of one or more uh, mixed race uh, Africans who were born in Germany after World War II to that combination of German women and African, usually African-American men. Uh, that's not my topic. Um, what I actually want to look at 
is uh, that, in fact, Hitler and what the Europeans, through their German high civilization, alleged high civilization point, um, perpetrated in the Second World War and in the late 1930s, has to be taken as a turning point in the history of European racism towards non-Europeans. Um, there are other possible um, turning points. One of them might be thought to be uh, the, the so-called explorations conducted by Spaniards and uh, Portuguese, or Portuguese and Spaniards, and then later other, other Europeans um, four or five centuries ago. Um, and clearly something extraordinarily important happened. But what happened um, with what I'm calling Euro-Nazism, what is sometimes called the Holocaust, um, what happened was that uh, European racism was brought home to Europe in a particularly destructive way. And they had, the Europeans that is, to deal with it. And the extent of the deception, the big lie that they told by way of managing um, their involvement in that monstrous crime against Jewish people, Africans, uh, so-called Gypsies, Ro Romani people, and communists um, is something that has to be properly understood. And so what I want to look at is, is precisely that. Um, the extent to which uh, white people, Europeans, constructed a big lie. And the big lie said that they recognized that something monstrous had happened. They recognized that that monstrous thing uh, was actually genuinely monstrous. And then they proceeded to say that it was an aberration. It wasn't really them. It was um, a German Nazi perversion of their culture and civilization and that they were going to turn systematically away from that behavior. Now, um, and the other elements of the lie involve telling us and themselves that by setting up the United Nations, um, by setting up UNESCO, by putting into place a whole set of um, international conventions and structures relating to the human rights, um, by freeing the colonies, um, places in Africa, in the Caribbean, in, in Asia, uh, that, and, and doing so in an alleged recognition of a, a wind of change, that somehow the white world had actually changed and was seriously changing. And my proposition is that we need to examine the scope of that lie and to understand exactly how they manage the deception, which has actually convinced some of us and to the extent that it has convinced some of us, it's important to undo that deliberately structured lie. Now, the extent to which Europe has not changed can be seen if we look at the world in which we live right at this moment. And let's just take a quick look. Um, there is Trump's America. And what Trump himself represents was captured very correctly by himself. It's in a book on his regime. Uh, and the author of the book was in the White House and allowed to be there when he produced this book. And it is said in there that somebody asked Trump, what is white trash? And his reply was, like me, only poor. 
and that captures uh, him and the essence of him to that moment. And it covers and captures people like Boris Johnson and Nigel Farage, white trash, only educated, white trash, only rich. And they're the ones who fundamentally and increasingly run the white world and therefore run the world. So um, now staying with Trump's America, everybody knows that the, U the US state is busy killing African-Americans, men and women, but mainly young men. The men don't have to be particularly young. Um, and everybody knows that that has generated a movement under the slogan, Black Lives Matter. And white America having, and this matters, some 12 years ago when Barack Obama was elected, white America bought out all of the bullets in their gun shops and most of the guns in their gun shops, and they still have them. But in this moment, pretending or persuading themselves into the belief that the slogan Black Lives Matter actually means white lives don't matter, they have decided that they are scared of African Americans and they have continued the process of deadly acquisition of armaments. And they are now no longer concealed in homes, but are being driven around in those deadly four wheelers um, in Trump parades. And Trump is busy promoting the idea that he can only lose this election um, if rigging takes place. And what those white trash people might do in those circumstances is anybody's guess, but it's an interesting and slightly terrifying moment. So staying with the nature of this moment, uh, it matters, we need to recognize that um, we're in a moment where some events are happening in France. In France, They call them terrorism. They've discovered something, discovered some decades ago, called Islamofascism. Um, and mm. I don't want to deny the existence of that thing, but I just want to contrast it against a state of affairs in which the people who are complaining about Islamofascist terrorism, and I don't say that it's on, on reality, are the people who have been responsible for destroying, never for any good reason, and sometimes on the basis of manifest and deliberate lies, destroying a series of Muslim countries, and in that destruction, occasioning the deaths of literally millions of Muslims. So we have what they did in Afghanistan. Afghanistan, of course, was not behind 9-11. It was their friends in Saudi Arabia who were, um, who were the perpetrators there. So Afghanistan, they destroyed. Um, Libya, Iraq, Syria, that's still happening, Somalia, and in each or every, many of those cases, and Yemen, um, something is produced in those territories that they tend to call humanitarian crises. One of them is happening in Yemen as we speak. Um, Europeans don't bother to see this as terrorism, uh, going back to France, um, the French white people have persuaded themselves and their president is a grand spokesperson of this, this position that somehow their commitment to liberty, equality, and whatever, 
and their commitment to secularism entitles them to mock the prophets and the, the deity of other religions, no matter how seriously the people of those other religions take their religion, and no, no matter the extent to which, unlike in Europe, secularism hasn't managed to ride roughshod and successfully over the religion on which basis those some societies in the world are still structured. So how it comes to be the case that some Europeans do not see that it is not only as they allowed Rushdie to convince them, it is not only art and literature that's sacred, but as some other people think that some other things, including their religious icons and their religious symbols, their prophets and their gods, really remain sacred, and that mocking them to prove the level of your secularity involves dangers. So, in this same moment, the white world has created a state of affairs in which almost without exception, Africa's resources are owned and controlled here and in places like here. So Paris, London, Bonn, Washington, New York, possibly Tokyo, possibly Peking, um, but fundamentally here in London. And somehow uh, that has occurred at the end of a period when colonialism is supposed to have been surrendered and when um, a wind of change is supposed to have blown through Africa. And the final and striking, there are many other important indicators of the, let us call it merely odd nature of the world in which we Africans and other non-Europeans live. Um, Am I wrong in detecting that not just Trump, but an increasing number of the allegedly best and brightest of Europeans are busy as we speak, fomenting a war against China, which now, how did China come to be where it is? People who hear me speak will know that I think that their revolution in 1949 and in the decades before 1949 mattered and that that revolution that took them out of the ambit of Western white power was extremely important. That revolution in which they drove out from out of their country, the allies of Western white power mattered profoundly. That is true, but fundamentally also, since that time, and especially since the late 1960s and through, through the 70s and after, people like Trump, European cap capitalists, he himself, Trump, was not all that involved in it because his business is entertainment and that side of, of, um, of entertainment is controlled by China. So Trump wasn't involved. But what his friends, not the swamp in Washington that he denounces for doing it, but capitalists transferred Western industrial production to China in pursuit of cheap labor and high profits. Nothing to do with the swamp in, 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 in Washington. The people in Washington, the politicians in, in, in Washington, if they could have done anything to restrict this capitalist drive to invest in not just China, actually, but especially China, um, to invest in production in, in, in those places, I believe that they would have stopped it. But given that the real forces were capitalism, and it is that capitalist companies, enterprises, um, big men that control the West, um, it would have been interesting, at the very least, had Washington, the occupants of the alleged swamp, been able and willing 
since they are in the pay of the very people who are transferring industry to China to stop those people who are their paymasters transferring industry to China. So, and yet, I repeat, don't have to look too carefully. And us Africans need to be careful. You know, we have a case against China, but we need to be careful about falling into the Western trap of believing that China is becoming our enemy or is fundamentally our, en our enemy, much more so than the real historical unchanged, fundamentally unchanged enemy, which is racist, white, Western capitalism, imperialism. The system that has been developing with its knee on our necks and its hands on our resources for the last at least 500 years. So how, despite what happened in Europe between 1933 and 1945, something that they call the Holocaust, where the most civilized European nation, allegedly Germany, managed to cause the death of some 20 million Russians for no good reason. Their, their, their main reason was that they were entitled to drive to the east. They were conquering an inferior people, not just a, a communist people, but an inferior people. And they needed the space of these Slavic inferiors and, and so on. Um, they murdered Jews. There's a figure of six million. It is now um, one of the things that has happened in the period since the Second World War is that um, the West has managed to put the proper discussion of what happened to the Jews during the Second World War beyond proper historical discussion and challenging that figure become something called Holocaust denial, which is a crime. It is an extraordinary state of affairs because every other Holocaust, and there have been many, including the one that is still being perpetrated against us Africans, which some Africans correctly in Kiswahili call the Mangamisi, um, which is still going on, um, you know, enslavement ended, colonialism ended, but neocolonialism is just as brutal, exploitative, destructive, and monopoly capitalism in places like Britain, France, Germany, the United States of America is just as brutally destructive of black lives as were things under colonialism. And sometimes in places where they have us, people who look like me, running the states, um, they are killing African young men and African others in exactly the numbers with much less restriction on their conduct than was once the case under colonialism, where people in Europe and others were actually looking at their conduct in, 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 in the colonies. So I think it is important that we ask and understand how it came to be that Europe committed that crime. It was their crime. The very important thing to understand is that the Holocaust was not an aberration. It's important to understand that European history within Europe and outside had been a site of multiple genocides for millennia. It, it is important that we understand that even though the Holocaust looked new and dreadful, if you take a careful look at the internal history of Western Europe, in 1492, when Columbus sailed across the Atlantic, the other famous thing that happened in that year was that Islam, understandably, and Jews were driven out of Spain and Portugal, the Iberian Peninsula. It matters that a century or two earlier, Jews had been driven out of 
England. It matters. There's at least one interesting art article that I read somewhere that said that in the period before the Jews were legally excluded from, from Britain, what had been happening was that the English government had been bleeding the Jewish community white. And once that's happened <clears throat> via taxation and other mechanisms, and they had nothing more to take from them, they drove them out of, of Britain. Um, so, importantly, internal genocides, pogroms, um, racist attacks on communities within Europe, on the Celtic fringes of Europe, on what they did in Ireland, on what they did to crofters in Scotland, um, on what they did to Wales. This is just talking about Britain, nowhere else. Um, the idea that there was something exceptional about the Euro-Nazi Holocaust is, of course, an absurdity. And it becomes even more an, of an absurdity at the point at which it is connected to what they were doing outside of Europe, which is that one after another, starting with the Gonches, so-called, in the Atlantic islands off the Iberian Peninsula, a little bit to the northwest of Africa and a little bit to the southwest of, of Europe. The, those islands had a population. And in the two centuries before Columbus, that population was invaded from the Iberian Peninsula and over the next period were systemically eliminated. Not many of the original inhabitants are left there. So that when they arrived, the Europeans, that is the Europeans from the Iberian Peninsula initially, in the Americas, they had been responsible for one the first external genocide of going abroad, finding beautiful people and killing them. And that the first such event had taken place in uh, those islands of Northwest Africa. There was even, and it matters, a history of genocide, barbarism, cannibalism, involved in something that they call the Crusades, which they haven't abandoned. But those historical events, there were probably four or five of them, the, the Crusades um, of six or seven or eight centuries ago, um, they actually shocked Islam by engaging in cannibalism in defense of one of the places that they succeeded in, 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 in capturing Islam laid siege to it, and they ate each other in order to survive the, the, the siege. Um, like I say, Islam hadn't ever seen anything quite like it before. So the monstrous conduct doesn't begin with Columbus and um, Henry the Navigator. It actually began before that in the Crusades and then in the uh, outreach, the destructive outreach to places like Madeira and, 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 and so on. Now, native Caribbean people in their millions destroyed in a very quick time. They, the people in the smaller islands of the Caribbean survived longer only because Initially, the Spaniards wasn't re weren't really interested in, in, in their islands or them. It's not because they were militarily up to much. It's not because the so-called Carib, now called Kalinago, were, um, were militarily able. They were no match for the Europeans. And when the Europeans were ready for them, they were swept out of the way exactly as the allegedly militarily incompetent um, Taino or Arawaks in the Great Rantilles were, because there was a military technological disparity. So the whole story doesn't have to be told today of 
the extent of the genocide that was the system of Atlantic slavery, the extent of the multiple genocides that were involved in colonialism. That's in the historical record, and it's not just Africa, and not just Africans, it's also Indians, it's also Chinese, it's um, African, original African people in Australasia and further east and, and northeast of Australia in, um, in all of those islands, Southeast Asia and further out in, into the Indian and Pacific Ocean. So um, there was nothing exceptional other than perhaps in its concentration and scale, not scale, concentration, in the Holocaust. If we look at what Belgians did in the Congo in the early years of the 20th century, um, the figures don't fall into insignificance beside the alleged six million gas chambered, holocausted by the Euro Nazis at the center of their alleged civilization. So something monstrous happened and they accepted that it was monstrous. And then they set out to try to persuade us that they had dealt with it and they were different people thereafter. Some of the evidence that I've already cited, the nature of the world in which we live now, the um, destruction of Islamic countries, the destruction of black lives in the United States of America and elsewhere, the capture and control of our resources, the murder of our leadership who tried to stand up against that kind of activity, um, that exploitation, um, suggests that really, if there has been change, the nature of the change has been such as to secure no change, as to secure an unchanging state of affairs or a changed state of affairs that's substantially how it was before the alleged change took place. And that is what we have to look at. Now, how was that managed? I've already said that it mattered that Europe acknowledged the monstrosity the European monstrosity of the Nazi German Holocaust. It matters that they did not see that as fundamentally a culmination of their genocidal internal and external history. Instead of that, I repeat, they said it was an exceptional aberration. So there is no association of those monstrosities conducted by allegedly civilized Europeans at their allegedly most civilized center with their historical and continuing racism. How then did they manage it? What they proceeded to do, and not enough attention has been paid to this matter, is to blame race, not racism, to attack and dethrone race, not racism, whilst continuing to exploit to the hilt racist practice worldwide. And the, the Islamophobia that has facilitated the systematic destruction of some five Islamic countries with millions of victims and allowed them nevertheless to complain against fascist, Islamo-fascist terrorism is the extraordinary thing that we face. So I say that they focused on race rather than racism 
intending fully and determinedly to continue with their racist practice. Now, how is that handled? Um, people who read around racism will know that there's a book by somebody called Montague, um, which is entitled Race, Man's Most Dangerous Myth. That kind of book is something that we have to look at and understand. But it is that book isn't an isolated item. In the period since the Second World War, Europe has invested a great deal of intellectual ideological energy in persuading itself and us, and some of us have been persuaded, that race is not a reality, that it has no biological basis, and that mobilizing on the basis of racial consciousness is wrong and backward. A major claim and a major achievement, and it is false. Not only is it false, because in fact, race is a biological, biogenetic reality, but it's false because nothing in the, the conduct of the European world since the Second World War, since the point at which they started to make that claim and to proceed on the basis of it, nothing in their conduct has in any way moved them away from race-based conduct, including genocide and exploitation of the worst historic kind. South Africa, we're coming back to that. Now, here are a leadership, Western white people, just fought each other with some of us joining in, in something called the Second World War. At the end of it, they say, we discovered that the Nazis were terrible. We didn't know all along. We discovered that the Nazis were terrible, and we are going to condemn what they did. We are going to put them on trial for putting Jews and communists and others into gas chambers, certainly Jews into gas chambers, and we are going to step away from that, and we are going to outlaw all of it via um, conventions that will be ratified worldwide, that will have UN um, backing and sanctions and so on. And they proceeded to do that, and it's convinced people. So um, they mobilized one of those institutions and many university, many university academics to put across the lie that race is biologically unreal. What are the elements of that false argument? The first element is, and I will tell you which and which of the points are true. The first element is true, which is that all of humanity belongs to one, let's call it race. Um, Homo sapiens is one species, a single species. Be no doubt about that. So that claim is true. And a second truthful claim connected with that is made, which is that given our common belonging to Homo sapiens sapiens, we are 90 plus percent similar similar genetic structures, 90-odd percent. And given that high level, that high quantum of genetic similarity, there is no significant racial difference. That last bit is false. There is significant racial difference. Um, I want to quote one sentence from a Caribbean scholar a man called M.G. Smith, 
There's a case against him. Apparently, he might have been some kind of CIA agent. Let's leave that to, to one side. Smith correctly says, biologically, the term race denotes any branch of mankind that differs phenotypically from others in hereditary physical characteristics. Characteristics, right? Now, the characteristics, he go, goes on to, to, to name them, and he has articles. This I'm quoting from a book by Smith called Culture, Race, and Class in the Commonwealth Caribbean. M.G. Smith, University of the West Indies, came out in um, 1984. Um, now, the differences are genetic. So it is not true to claim that even though we're 90 odd percent genetically similar, that the points at which we're different have no genetic basis because they are not only biogenetically, they're not only biogenetic, but they're bi biogenetically fixed. That is to say, my facial features, my kin uh, uh, color, um, and some other aspects of, of, of me, um, which make me different from, say, Boris Johnson or Donald Trump, um, are fixed. And the only way to alter that, and it cannot be altered in my physical lifetime, that I could, though, by mating with a, a woman of another race, produce children that combine the genetics um, differences of myself and that racial partner, and our children would be the manifest result of that. That is one of the ways in which um, fixed racial biogenetic features can change. So it is simply not true to argue, as Europeans have done, using prestigious um, academics and using prestigious in institution, UNESCO, to, to, to put across the lie that race is a biological, biogenetic unreality, and that it is only and solely um, what they call a social construct, and therefore unreal. Um, now, uh, so what we have is a set of people who were in fact determined to carry on their old way within the ambit of their historic racism and to distract attention, their own where it's relevant and certainly ours where it matters by persuading us and themselves that nothing that they were doing was really racial because they were no longer acting on the basis of race, because race was not a biogenetic reality, and they had moved away from it, seen through it, and they would never again make the mistake that Hitler had made. And what is more, this is repetition, they hanged a few Germans and set up these grand structures that left themselves fully in command of the world system. They have veto in the key parts of the UN that matters, the Security Council. China also has a veto and Russia also has a veto, but they're frequently misled and misunderstand what the, the, the wicked whites are, are, are really doing. Um, so, let us look at these people who had put race, not racism, behind them in the post-war period. Incidentally, the concentration camp, which was the mechanism using railroads by which they got Jews and gypsies and commies and others and Africans too, into eventual gas chambers and points of elimination via gases or slave labor. Um, and I repeat, at Nuremberg, 
war crimes tribunal, condemnation, death by hanging, occasionally life sentences. And then those um, concentration camps, to return briefly to them, weren't invented by the Nazis at all. They turn up first in Cuba, used by Spain, and next time in South Africa, used by Britain against the Boers. So Germany doesn't invent them for use against the Jews. They are there already inscribed in European racist practice. Um, most of the people that they were fighting in Cuba were actually black people, um, but in South Africa, the British were fighting fellow whites, Boers, Dutch people. So the question is, how did they act after that, after the um, war crimes tribunals, after setting up these elaborate human rights entities, after pretending to the world that they had changed and were going to act differently. This is the point at which we actually have to look again and properly at how they really acted. And what we see in Asia and Africa is that nothing whatsoever had changed at fundament, right? Now, they felt able to surrender colonies where the institution of neocolonialism would be relatively easy. And if necessary, after a few communists or people who could be called communists were killed, right? Um, so generally speaking, and you, it doesn't matter where you look, um, in Jamaica, they throw, they don't kill them, they throw four alleged communists out of the People's National Party before it's allowed to come to, 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 to power. In Guyana, they overturn a Marxist Communist Party, the PPP, um, on the grounds that it's communist and, and anti-democratic despite them winning a democratic election. In Cuba, they were busy killing communists in significant numbers. And throughout colonial, neo-colonial entities, that was, that was the practice. So in places where with the this or that murder of communists and, and left-wingers and genuine nationalists, Neocolonialism could be instituted. That was the intent. And that's what Harold Macmillan had in mind. The French had something even less genuine than that in mind. But in other places where whites were settled or where what they considered to be real resources were at stake, they tried to hold on to territories. That's what the French were doing in Indochina, in Vietnam. And that's what they were doing when in the mid 50s, they were defeated at Dien Bien Phu. They were trying to hold on to Indochina and fighting a legitimate nationalist movement for possession of their territory. And the Americans went in after the French were defeated and caused the death of in excess, I don't know how many, maybe 7 million. Vietnamese, right? And these are people who had just put their fellow Europeans to the gallows for doing exactly that. And then we have Kenya and we have Algeria. In Algeria, some right wing settler col colons say Algiers is France bugger the, the, the Arabs, it's ours, and we will kill and torture and murder in abundance in order to stay here, bugger you. 
same thing. Go and check the figures for the deaths of Arabs in Algeria in order to get the French out of a territory that clearly was Algiers, Alger Algeria, Algiers, not France, not French in any way. All it was was that some illegitimately settled French people were in that part of northern France. Um, some Italians had done exactly the same thing um, in Libya. Now, then we have Kenya. A group called the Kenya Land and Freedom Army, late 40s, early 50s, decided that something that had happened in the early part of the 20th century, namely the total dis displacement of legitimate African settlers who were using their land in legitimate African um, agricultural ways, were not actually an occupation of their lands and could be displaced legitimately. Uh, the African people knew all along that it was wrong. Right from the start, they fought against it. Right from the start, they got brutally defeated. Then, and, and there were uprisings of different scales and organization of different scales coming through the 20s and, 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 and 30s. But in the late 40s and early 50s, they, they turned to armed struggle. And the, 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 the Europeans um, were extraordinary. They said, these barbarians, um, they never occupied the land. They were never using the land properly. Um, we're entitled to stay here. Um, we can put a million of them and more into protected villages, gas, um, um, into protected villages and other mechanisms very similar to what had been used against Jews and communists and gypsies in Europe less than seven years earlier. And they had hanged their fellow Europeans for it. And, and you go and read the parliamentary papers here, and you will see government ministers getting up and saying, not a thing is wrong what with, with what we're doing. What we're doing is fighting some barbarians. We're entitled to do what we do, what we're doing. And indeed, the things that the bad things that are being asserted against us are in fact not true. We now know, and we knew all along, although the British, who document everything because they document everything, also needed to destroy everything. And so it's taken some time to re-document and, and to put into, in, into books um, the, the, the stuff about their real genocide in, in Kenya between about 1952 and 1956, right? And the same happens in Southern Africa the same happens in the Portuguese colonies. So here are, peop are people who, and, and Gandhi was absolutely right. Somebody asked him, what do you think of European civilization? And, and Gandhi's answer says that it really doesn't exist and that if it existed, it would be a good idea, although what it would be is another matter. But in principle, it would be, be, be a good idea. It's absolutely right. It's a non-existent thing. This is a people who um, from long before Christopher Columbus, long before the, the, the period of the Crusades, long before the time when they started to kill those people in the Atlantic Islands, as far back as them arriving in ancient Hindustan, and erecting on the basis of that wonderful civilization a color hierarchy that is still inscribed to a substantial extent in Hinduism. So the moment the Europeans escaped from the ice that modified them out of us and created the monsters that they are in their icy circumstances, every time they leave, and go somewhere else, they proceed to deploy power, to destroy ruthless power, and to set up oppressive pigmentocracies. It's not new. And the Marxists, and I'm one of them, who 
I know it to be true, because I'm not that kind of <laughs> Marxist, who believe that European racism is a, is a creature of the last 500 years, a creature of capitalism, and simply wrong. There is historical evidence that the people who were created in the harsh conditions of the last ice age, especially the ones who uh, didn't migrate eastwards and become Bayesian, Chinese, and Native Americans, the ones who stayed in the ice of Europe, um, are a set of genocidal barbarians who have no morality. They only have interest, which they pursue with an extraordinary ruthlessness. And that was true three, four, five thousand years ago in ancient Hindustan. It was true a little bit later than that in Mesopotamia. It was true in ancient Greece. It was true in ancient Rome. It was true in the Middle Ages. And there is evidence of their racism in all of those places. So it doesn't begin with something called modernity. It is a fundamental feature of their history. Now, my last point. Not only am I saying that we must reject, because it is false, the notion that race has no bio biogenetic basis. So us Africans are a biogenetic entity called a race, distinguished by my phenotype with the variations that exist in continental Africa and elsewhere in the world where we've spread and not been modified by cold. But in addition to our biogenetic reality, somebody said, it turns up in a quotation in a book, uh, It, and what it says is that African Americans were the only ones with a really creative culture to defend in that space, and that all acts of surrender of that culture um, were minimally stupid and frequently worse. So, if that is true in United States of America, if it's true in the Caribbean, how much more true is it in continental Africa? And to say that it is true is to open up the fundamental importance of our civilizational heritage, which is actually richer than anybody else's by a long chalk, older, richer, much more complex. Um, fundamental to human creativity and human civilizational achievement. And that is the civilizational heritage on which Africans biologically real, biogenetically inscribed in nature, historically stand and boast and declare. And it is extremely important that we take a step back and understand the way in which embarrassed Europeans facing their own behavior during the period around the Second World War, and specifically in Germany, acted to set up a set of lies about race and humanity from which they could benefit. One final point is worth making. And this is dangerous because of the power of certain people in the world in which we live. But a feature of this post-war moment is that the Europeans, having been responsible for the mass murder of a significant proportion of European Jewry, allowed them, on the basis of something called the Balfour Declaration, which itself makes it clear that a national home for the Jews in Palestine 
could not be set up because it would endanger Jews in Arab countries and much more importantly would endanger the Palestinian in inhabitants of that place who were there before Abraham alleged that his God sent him there, right? That is the descendants of, of, of those people. Now, since then, um, sheer power, first British power before the Second War, and then American and British and French power since the Second World War, has enabled world Jewry to constitute the last, most ruthless, most brutal settler colony built directly on mass murder in 1948, built directly in 1948 on displacement of people, which is still going on. And people who in the UK are busy condemning Corbyn, no friend of mine, for anti-Semitism, have been party to two things that interest me. One is that the fundamental anti-Semitism of the post-World War II period has been the anti-Semitism directed by Jews and the West against the, the Arab peoples of the world, and especially the, Arab, the Palestinian Arabs. That is the fundamental anti-Semitism of the post-Second World War period. The other thing is that in calling Corbyn's moral position into question, and it may well be in question, I don't know. Um, well, I do know, but that's for another session. Um, these are people who, as we speak, are in cahoots with Donald Trump and with the most backward elements in Arab society who are stooges and worse of, of the West, who are busy betraying the Palestinian people for next to nothing. In fact, they're paying the West <laughs> um, to enable them to betray the Palestinian people. And, and how in those circumstances um, Corbyn came to allow Zionists to call him anti-Semite and not to make the point in the clearest terms about who it was that were coming at him, one, and not to make the point that already in the moment of his election, all of the points that have subsequently been made and all of the manipulation, the most spectacular bit of which has been to use a uh, equalities commission to set up um, an apparently impressive um, condemnation of Corbyn and the Labour Party. The people who wrote it asked no question about the meaning of anti-Semitism. They mix up categories that are fundamental to anti-discrimination law within the report. They talk about um, things being the tip of the iceberg. And when you look at the, the evidence, there is no iceberg. When you look at the way in which the Labour Party, in defense of complaining Jewish people, moved against Africans and others right here in London, moved against Ken Livingston with no argument in their favor, with the truth being on Livingston's side. And you have to wonder how it comes to be possible for something like that to happen. And then you have to know that power matters. You have to know that you're talking about Western power. You're talking about the power of um, the Jewish community internationally. You're talking about the power of their lobbies. You're talking 
And this is in, I'm a student of sociology and history. I've read in the past the Jewish Journal of Sociology and there are articles in there about how they set up um, what they call gatekeepers in institution after institution. What are the questions that must be asked about which Jewish Zionist gatekeepers are employed in the commission that last Thursday or Friday brought out that stupid, lying, misleading report against the Labour Party? And all that's at stake is that British Jews, most of whom are Zionists, and who are used to having a Labour Party led by Zionists, found Corbyn elected against their will as leader of the Labour Party. Corbyn was the first anti-Zionist to occupy that position. And before he was in place, the, the documentation attacking him, saying exactly the same things, that they ended up saying and that they ended up putting in the mouth of that official state commission were being said. So we live in a complicated world and our duty is to understand it and to explain it and to take the risks that are involved in telling the truth about these matters. Thank you. Well, um, I think all the viewers have heard what you got to say. Um, so now we're just waiting for them to bring some points forward. Uh, there's one here. So let me start off with this one. Um, okay, where is it going? Uh, oh, just kind of jumped away. Uh, Okay, yeah. As, yeah. as you can see, I'm surprised that you is suggesting that race is a biogenetic yeah. rather than a Well, construct. I'm not surprised that our brother or sister, whoever is um is there, is is surprised. What I was trying to explain and it really matters is that a lot of European racist energy went in to finding a way to continue their anti-black and anti-Chinese and anti-Indian racism by devaluing um, the notion race by saying it has no validity whilst continuing their own racist practice in the way that I have tried to show in this 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 um talk that I've done. It, it is perfectly easy for me to go to the, and I have all of the books on my shelf somewhere in my, in my library, uh, to go to the um, UNESCO um, structuring of this lying argument that um, race is not a biogenetic reality. I read you one quote from a significant Caribbean scholar, M.G. Smith. And let me read the quote again for our brother or sister who is surprised at the truth. Um, biologically, the term race denotes any branch of mankind that differs phenotypically from others in hereditary physical characteristics. That is the definition the biological, the biogenetic de definition of race. And it doesn't mean that we're not all within Homo sapiens, sapiens we, we, we are. And it doesn't mean that all of Homo sapiens, sapiens doesn't share more than 90% bio, um, biogenetic similarity. It is the biogenetic difference, which is undeniable, which is permanent, which is only variable by intermarriage or by genetic accident, yeah? And so the claim that race is simply a social, socio-historical construct 
it is that, but it is also, and more importantly, biogenetic and importantly, culturally fundamental. And I, as an African, am not interested in allowing anyone, and I have colleagues in my, my former university, in the University of the West Indies, who, who swallowed this false line, hook like line and sinker. And my task today, and I can develop it further in next time by actually bringing along the um, UNESCO material, um, which shows the way in which Europeans in the aftermath of the Second World War set out to do something, which was continue their racism and you know, instead of attacking their own racism, attacking race and building a framework for continuing their exploitative and wicked and destructive and, and um, genocidal racist practice worldwide, whilst pretending that they're not any longer committed to race. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the same brother's got another yep. point, which it's good to bring up. Um, <clears throat> as you can see, there's pointing out in the book Silent Wars, Imperialism and Changing no, I, I know the literature you know. Covers. So there's really no point in oh. telling me that there's a whole gigantic literature. That's a point I'm making. That white and blacks who didn't have any commitment to understanding what is happening to us racially, accepted the white lie of the post-Second World War period that race is not a biological reality. And in the process of that, they have been willing to abandon the racial basis of our civilizational heritage. And I'm not buying that from anybody. And, and I think that Africans who bought it and some of them are educated people, are doing us harm. So please don't tell me that there are books which make the opposite point to the one I'm making. I'm saying that those books are consciously or otherwise part of the post-World War white deception, World War II white deception on this particular matter. Okay, uh, there's another point here. Uh, <clears throat> Say the power of lobbies is function of big government if the state is limited. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, but the world is structured as it is. Um, power, um, lobbying power is frequently the, 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 the power of institutional wealth, um, the power of capital and so on. So as, as long as the system is structured broadly as it is, um, lobbies will be powerful and there will be some lobbies that are, for example, humanitarian, that are environmentalist and, and so on. They're always gonna be less powerful than the really powerful lobbies. And that's a problem that we face, but nothing in the current order of things renders lobbies irrelevant. They are powerfully relevant because they represent interest, either positive interest as in, in this moment, um, environmentalism does, or in the United States as, you know, Black Lives Matter does, but you know, in comparison to Black Lives Matter, um, it's probably true that the media is reasonably well disposed towards Black Lives Matter. But even so, the power lies elsewhere. Okay. Well, I've got a point. I've got a little question here. I mean, you mentioned about the feeling of entitlement yes. uh, by Europeans. Uh, that leads them to mock what is sacred yeah. to others. 
So um, what's going on in France now, for example? So you would think the reaction is justified? Well, in terms who, of whose reaction? The reaction of, say, the Islamic world. No, wait, wait, wait. No, I, I don't say that. No, 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 but I'm no, asking. It, 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 no, 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 it's all right. What mm. I say is this, that here we have a culture, Western Europe, that has been secularized over the past five or so hundred years. Um, secularism, secular science, um, rode roughshod over and defeated Christianity. That's what happened in Europe. So Europe, certainly in a deep way, is secularized. And along with that secularization, there have been, developed some values. Which, and those values include saying that it is all right to mock the sacred, the traditionally sacred. And that is okay in Europe because Europe is a space in which the secular has won. There are some other spaces in the world where the secular has not won. Islam is one of them. And the West should have learned from and not allow themselves to be deceived down the Salman Rushdie road. Salman wrote something, an essay, which I read carefully more than once. It was called, Is Nothing Sacred? And what the essay effect in effect says is that the traditionally religious sacred is not sacred, is available to be mocked by people like me, but there is something sacred, and that sacred something is art and literature. Now, you can buy that and run the risks that go with it. Because if you take it to the point where you mock the sacred of the Hindu, or you mock the sacred of Islam, you might run into trouble, which is what happened with Rushdie, which is what happened with those stupid people at Charlie Hebdo, in, in, in France, which is what happened to that teacher who believes that somehow, um, because they are Westerners, they are entitled without fear and without consequences to mock other people's sacred. And you're not entitled to do that, not really, and not without risk. And, and when those who value from those other spaces, the sacred, come at you out of elements of their culture, which you might consider barbarism, right? Um, I make the additional point that, yes, there are barbarous elements in Islam, but that is all that the West focuses on. In my talk, I was concerned to remind people about the extent, the monstrous extent of Western barbarism not in long days gone by, not under colonialism and enslavement, but in the period since the Second World War, when their barbarism included reinstituting um, concentration camps in Kenya, when their barbarism included causing the death of more than 7 million Vietnamese for no good reason, when I don't know the figures for Algeria. I don't know the figures for Southern Africa. But we're talking real barbarism here. And, and the only barbarism that gets into the Western press is, is when an a, a, a Islamic terrorist kills somebody or cuts off somebody's head. What about all of the provocation that the West is throwing at these religions, including the destruction of their many countries and including the assault on their most sacred, including the, the, um, the, the prophet of Islam. That's what I'm saying. Okay, yeah, that's, that's quite clear. So it was just to tease that out because I think um, there's a... Hold on, there's another point here. Um, I think there's a race concept and then the genetic concept. Okay. 
okay, I hear what this person is saying. And yes, he's, 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 he's right. Um, European racists use race and misconceptions of race in order to, to and tied it to racial superiority. Nothing in what I said or what I believe or have read in any of the books whose position I accept um, says anything about African racial superiority. Although I do say that we have a cultural heritage that's at least as rich and probably richer than anybody else's. I do say that, but that is not a basis for the um, oppression of any other people. And I'm not arguing for the oppression of any other people. Um, Europeans used race synonymously with racial superiority. And the fact that that is so has provided some of the space in which they have persuaded people that race as a notion should be jettisoned, right? The fact that they misused it doesn't mean that it is not biogenetically valid. Okay. Um, the brother that brought up the point has come back just to uh, because in your answer, I thought so. I just said, so Okay, I'm glad, for Rudy, I'm glad for Rudy agrees with me. Some okay. people do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. There's a a brief point here that that I don't know what to make of. Marxism ah, is also a <laughs> white. My, my friend, my friend from Jamaica, Kofi, who I do know, um, some elements of, right, Kofi knows that I have some commitment to a version of, of Marxism. Kofi should know that the version of Marxism that I adhere to is not conventional Marxism. I know that a case has been made for the racism of Karl Marx. I know that many Marxist parties and Marxist individuals in Europe have historically been racist. I know all of that. And the commitment to um, Marxism that I have, which I share with some other iconic black people, including Walter Rodney and um, Kwame Nkrumah and, 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 and others, um, is not the racist official variant of Marxism. It's it's the the version that has gone through the through the mill of Cabral and the mill of Rodney and and, and, and the mill of Fanon and so on. And 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 it's a different and for me usable set of ideas. Okay. Um he also says this, uh, same coffee. At... Oh yes, no, I'm, I'm, I don't know, right? That's the language of the people who are unprepared to respect um, religious fundamentalism. Now, I don't say that some religious fundamentalist positions are not difficult ones that have to be fought. What I do say, however, is that there is no secularism derived right without fear to attack and mock other people's most sacred position. And if you do that, you run the risk that some of them will come at you and they will feel entitled to come at you. So I think that all rights have limits and there is no unlimited right of Western secularists to attack um, other people's religious values. None. Okay. Not unlimited. Right, and then, then this one asks you to compare the issue of race and contrast that with Sheikh on the opposition and race. 
No, um, Sheikh Anta Diop's position, and, and I'm a big fan of, of Sheikh Anta Diop, is a position that, that I hold. Um, he wrote a lot, you know, <laughs> and so his position on race includes the stuff that, 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 that he did on ancient Egypt, pointing out the extent to which after the, 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 the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century, um, European racists set out to deny the blackness of the ancient Egyptians and so on. That's a position on, 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 on race, and it's to do um, with the defense and reprieve and rescue of our key cultural civilizational achievement. So Diop is massively important, and that's what his, his work on ancient Egypt is about. Now, elsewhere in his, in, in, in his work, um, he talks about the development of, um, of, of races or subgroups, racially defined subgroups within the human population. And if you go and read his stuff, you will see that he talks about the impact of the last ice age. It's called the room glaciation um, and, and, and the extent to which that in the circumstances of um, the, 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 the northern continent and especially Europe um, produce genetic um, social isolation, um, genetic drift, and um, one other biological um, accident where, you know, the, the thing that happens to produce um, what in Jamaica we call dundus, what's, what's the word? It doesn't <laughs> matter. Oh. Huh? Say again. Oh, I'm, I'm trying to think myself. Yeah, exactly. All right. So, um, Diop deals with all of that, and 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 he talks about um, the blackness of the, the first settlers in in ancient Britain and so on. So, Diop's work is fundamentally about race, but he also, and he's very French in this regard, he says that it has to be done on the basis of science, not ideology. And, and so he always holds systemically, systematically, fundamentally to the proposition that um, race um, is a scientifically established and value, um, viable and necessarily correct um, biogenetic concept and, and, and so on. All of that is in Diop's work. Okay. So the word we was looking for, I think, is albinism. Yes, albinism. Yes, but that <laughs> is that that, 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 starts, that 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 starts by um, a, a, an accident within the the the, the, the genes, the, the genetic structure of, of of the person who is black and whose parents are black, but something happens and they they come out with a white skin and 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 and, and so on. Now, um, the the, 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 the argument is that Africans in the horrendous condition of the last glaciation, last ice age in Europe, in small social groups, face social isolation, face um, um, genetic accidental change that got reinforced um, in, in a process called genetic drift. And all of this is established in the biology, in the biogenetics. And, and, and it leaves human beings 90 odd percent similar and those differences matter because on the basis of them in, in the places where we stay, we develop or didn't leave, we develop cultural and civilizational achievement that we have to defend because they're ours. True. And that, that's what Diop was doing when he said that the, the Europeans who um, had always known, because if you go back to ancient Greece, you see that they, they, they say that they, the people across the, the, um, the, the Mediterranean are, 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 are black people um, and, and so on and so forth. And, and Europeans know who the ancient Egyptians were until the end of the 18th century, when they set out to tell lies that were contradicted by their own ancient writers, as well as by the evidence. The evidence of who the ancient Egyptians were 
go to the British Museum. I don't know if it's open right now, but just go and look. The best source at, at the, the sculptures in there and see how many faces you see that don't look like mine or yours, my, my, my brother, or even more strikingly phenotypically African. Very few. Right from the start to the end. Indeed, when I first went to the British Museum, it would have been decades ago, the, the exhibition was organized chronologically. It's no longer organized chronologically. And part of the reason why it's not organized chronologically, I think, although they might be doing other things, is that when you start with a black person, right, phenotypically black, with, with thick lips and all of that stuff, and you go from there right to the end, and nothing changes, or next to nothing changes, the story is very easy, and it is an inescapable story that these were black Africans who were, were, were doing this stuff. And um, in those days, the really popular, with children now, part of the Egypt exhibi exhibition was the mummy room, because most of the mummies they had in, in there and the, the mummy-related literature came from late Egypt, and a lot of them were not Egyptian at all or mixed Egyptians and Greeks and so on. And, and they were telling a lie using that very late Egyptian stuff to, to convince the young kids that um, <laughs> the ancient Egyptians were not black people. Mm. That's true. Okay, there's another point I've got, because, you know, during, I was jotting down some note during uh, while he was talking. Now, one of the things that jumped out at me, you were saying London um, is the controller in terms of African resources and a major control, although most of the finance yes. comes through London. Yes. Could you just expand on that a bit more? Because it's, um, it's undoubtedly, that is undoubtedly true. And um, it, it's a difficult thing to study. But the truth of the matter is that if you take South, South Africa, for example, the gold, the diamonds, um, the platinum, whatever else is there, all of those big resources mm -hmm. are controlled right here in London, right? Um, you know, in, in 2012, they murdered those Africans, the, the South African government in cahoots with a company called Lonmin, murdered and shot down approaching 100 Africans, 30-odd were, were, were killed, and, and, and so on. The Marikana Massacre. That company has since been sold. But sold though it is, it's still controlled by a company registered in the city of London. Right? And, and um, about four years ago, um, some people did a study. They called it the new colonialism. But, and, and what they're talking about was the extent to which African resources, doesn't matter what you're talking about, fish, diamond, gold, platinum, legitimately extracted, mm -hmm. um, is controlled from the metropole and owned here. Yeah, And that, that's the point I was making. It's undoubtedly the case. And again, um, in, in a, if, if, if we were to want to explore that, next time I'm on or the time after that I'm on, I'm perfectly willing to go through the figures. The material is available. Yeah, because, because yeah, I'll be somebody that's very interesting to find the extent at which, you know, um, the resources of Africa is basically from, coming from yeah, all right. finances. Um, that's the commitment. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll delay so, the, the race one and UNESCO and all of that to the time after that. On the next occasion, okay. what I will look at is the extent of the control of African resources in the metropoles and especially in the city of London. London. Okay. Yeah. And uh, sometimes the companies are Indian, sometimes the companies are Australian, but they're headquartered here, and what they're doing is holding and controlling and ripping off African resources. Hmm. That's interesting. I mean, I know you're going to talk about it, but 
have you any um, reason as to why they would all choose to register here or base themselves? Because, um, and it's long been so, the city of London is the headquarters of world capitalism, right? Um, believe it or not. And, and, and that being so, and with Britain being in the EU on, until recently, and that's the stupidity of, of, of leaving, um, London was the place to be for capitalist enterprises, and in particular, capitalist enterprises that control resources in Latin America, Africa, and parts of Asia. Now, it's a historic state of affairs that hasn't changed and is being reinforced right now as we speak. Yeah, okay. well, that's fine. That's interesting because I know the gold reserve of, um, what is it, Venezuela is right here. Yeah. So, so was the case for Iraq as well. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that's fine. So we'll, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll explore that. Okay. Um, all being well, the, the first Sunday of right. December. Okay, there's another point here that's came up by Conan. You speak about the white racism in I said Mesopotamia and in other parts. Okay. Um I, I, I don't know what Diop has to say about white racism in, in, in Mesopotamia in Mesopotamia. May have something to say about that, but I can't re pretend to remember re remember that. The the um At Fundament, what we have to remember is that the world starts off as us, black people, and world civilization starts off with us. So in, in Mesopotamia, I shouldn't mention that first, in the Nile Valley in Mesopotamia and in the Indus Valley in India, we're talking about early civilizations and the this is something else that I can talk about and actually have the the, the, the pictorial material to, to to go with it. The the iconography of those old civilizations shows now if you go to India and look at the old temples or go even further east than India to to you know Vietnam to Laos and so on um, those temples the the the, the people um, the figures that decorate them, the old ones, are, are, you know, strikingly African. And then something happened um, in India and in Mesopotamia, especially in India, that um, people who call themselves Indo-European, who are light-skinned or white, invade and conquer India. And um, set up uh, a religious ideology. That's what Hinduism is. It's actually a pigmentocracy. It, 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 it um, ascribes goodness and divinity to whiteness and, and all the way down the chain. And that still operates in India. When Nehru passed, the man who was to succeed him was somebody called Jagzivan Ram, blacker Indian than you and me. And they wouldn't let him succeed. They put in Shastri instead, right? Pure, unadulterated race, racism, India. Now, um, in Mesopotamia, we're talking about Sumer. We're talking about a whole set of other civilizations there. If you go and look at the iconography, you will see um, racial mixture emerging. And that is because in that part of the world, thousands of years ago, some of these Indo-Europeans who had been transformed in the ice and were now stronger and, and reaching out and reaching out aggressively were beginning to penetrate that part of, of, of the world as well. And you can see it in the old representations of the, 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 the kings and, 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 and so on. Uh, again, this is something that um, if there's interest, I used to teach this stuff at, um, at, at Head Start. 40 years years ago, and we can go back over some of it on on, on, on this, this this program because it, it's important and and people need to understand 
the 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 extent to which um, those historical processes by which um, whiteness imposed on black cultures and sometimes quite successfully and sometimes with, with mixtures that the, the black people um, accommodated and so on. And that, that stuff is, is, is documented, um, explicable, and the material is available. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. There's another point I have here um, from your presentation. And that is a point concerning China. Yes. You said European is fermenting a war against China. Yes, so, I do believe that. I do oh, believe that. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I right. Trump is um, a, a focus of it, but it's by no means just him. And if it was just him, it wouldn't be so worried. But in my talk, I said, that some of the best and brightest Europeans are now, you can hear it on the BBC, you can see it in, 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 in the better newspapers and it's whole screed of books that, that, that are coming out. Um, you can see it in the way in which they promoted those crazy young Hong Kong people who have forgotten that they're Chinese in, in earlier this year or, 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 or last year over nothing when, right? Um, can you imagine some young people in London or New York or um, Washington acting against the state in the way that those Hong Kong young people acted and, 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 and being praised by the, by the British press yeah? or by the BBC or by Sky? And yet, right, so... Um, Almost everything that can be used against China is now being used. So Trump's thing is that they spread the, 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 the virus, and Trump's thing is that they're, they, they, for years, were exploiting the, the U.S. market. He doesn't bother to talk about the extent to which China's strength um, at the level of industrial production is a function of the fact that Western enterprise after enterprise, Western capitalism after capitalism, sourced their stuff there and invested in, in production there because it was cheaper, more efficient, whatever, right? Nothing to do with the Washington swamp. And the only reason Trump wasn't involved in, in, in that transfer of production to China is that that isn't his kind of business. His business is tourism and, and entertainment. That's the only reason he, he wasn't in, 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 involved in that. So the, the Westerners who are mounting this, this campaign um, pretend to be con concerned about the freedom of young Chinese in Hong Kong. Since when? The Westerners who are talking about this thing uh, pretend to be concerned about the Uyghurs. The Uyghurs are Muslim on the edge of China. Um, the Chinese say they're, 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 they're terrorists. They may or may not be. But this is the same Western people who Mr. Macron, Macron <laughs> is calling terrorists in, 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 in the West. And the Chinese government, the Chinese government may be wrong, but they're saying that these people are acting against them and that they have to manage their, their, their presence in, in Chinese society. Um, uh, the, the Western people who are starting this ideological war against China also talk about the um, oppressive um, nature of the Chinese state. This is their traditional anti-communism. In their pursuit of their interests, Westerners use every ideological line that they can use, and very frequently they forward as defenders of freedom when all they're doing, and, and free markets, when all that they're doing is defending their interests. Um, 
Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan were defenders of South Africa on the ground of its um, in, economic importance to the West, on the ground that it was an anti-communist bastion, and so on and so forth. It's those same arguments from the descendants of those folk, some of them more liberal than Thatcher and, 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 and Reagan, who are um, formulating this argument in which they fulminate against China. And I say that we Africans and everybody in the world really has to be careful about it mm -hmm. because racist Westerners are mobilizing against the Chinese and it's, 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 it's a racial mobilization, racist mobilization. Okay. Well, I think we're running out of time fast, so let's bring in Dunguemani <laughs> to the thing. But just before we end, I'd just like you to touch on the point about you, you brought it up in terms of the Mangamizi, what happened in Africa around yeah. that, and um, uh, okay. you know, just to enlighten us a bit yeah. more. On that. Um, it, it, it needed to be mentioned and can be returned to briefly. The point mm -hmm. I'm making is that um, the Holocaust against the Jews and Blacks and, and Communists and Gypsies in mm -hmm. Europe was not exceptional, that Europe had a history of genocide internally and externally, that they had been genociding Jews for something like 2,000 years. Um, I talked about the extent to which um, in England, the British state had first bled the Jews of their wealth and then turf them out, out of the society. So, so uh, how far back was that? I think, that, if I remember that, right, about 13th or 9th, 9th century or 11th? No, um, Cromwell let them back in. So it happened three centuries before Cromwell, right? So Cromwell was 1600, so the, the expulsion mm, of the Jews was something like 1300 and something. Yeah, about 1300. Yeah. Something. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so the point I was making was that internally, there were, were, were genocides and extermination as, as part of European history. And that as they went out of, of beyond their borders, now empowered by a technology that the Chinese could have had and decided, for example, that gunpowder was for entertainment, not for war. Right? Um, so the, 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 the Europeans, their one strength, one fundamental strength was military technology. And they were, in the modern era, superior to everybody at, at that level and therefore defeated everybody at that level. And on the basis of that military technology, instituted genocide after genocide. They genocided the, the native Caribbean people and multiple genocides were involved um, against Africans under enslavement, colonialism and neocolonialism. And it's still going on. And that's what the Kiswahili word Mangamizi speaks to. It speaks to the fact that millions upon millions upon millions of Africans were and still are being genocided by racist European power in its own economic interest. And, okay. and, and yeah. All right, then. So I'll bring back Yakabir. Yeah, Run right out of time, gone way past eight o'clock. So again, Elder Cecil, thank you for your very enlightening information. I'm sure we've all learned a lot. As I know your research is thorough and the and like you said, 40 odd years ago in Head Start, a lot of <laughs> it was yours there pushing a lot of information. And it's great to see that you're still on the road doing it. And people are still, brothers and sisters, are still benefiting very much so from your, you know, wealth of knowledge. So I thank you again for your presentation. Okay, at this point now, I'd like to hand over to Ndugu Marni, who will be closing, closing out for us with the change of energy. Okay, Asante Sana. Asante Sana, Ndugu. Again, um, Asante Sana, uh, Asante Sana, MZ Cecil, 
as Ndugu and Dugu Tahaka eloquently said about your contribution and the um, for all your life and your political activism all your life and you know we have a a a unpaid debt that we can never pay to you as one of the founding members of the Pan African Congress movement and for the many people that you've you've taught all over the world and one of the great historians living that we have in the African community worldwide so we are honored to have you and, and for what you do so we want to give you your flowers and your respect now and not you know just call you when we're pausing libations you know because we were standing in one of the greats that we will mention for generations to come and we thank you for your dedication elder and you've inspired many of us including both into the tahaka and myself so asante sana thank you yeah, sana. okay so let us now uh, end our this wonderful session that we've had today and end, end it with our ritual so closing the closing ritual and so in Dukataka, i will share my screen so let's have a look see oh something's gone wrong here but i've got to go back so let me cancel that bear with me everyone uh-huh all right so let's go here now try that again yeah, there we go. Okay, okay. Right. Do good. that should be able to be seen now. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes, oh. All right, fine. So what we're going to do is we're going to ring the triangle chime. We'll ring it seven times, uh, seven times for wisdom, seeking and truth and intuition. That's what it means spiritually. But seven is a spiritual number that we see throughout existence. You see the seven laws of Tahuti, the seven major notes of the scale, seven um, uh, seven colors in the spectrum, in the spectrum, seven layers to the skin. Uh, in mythology, seven deadly sins, seven seven um, uh, uh, seven uh, the set the, the seven um, uh, the the seven trials of Hercules and so on and so and, and, and so and so on and so forth. So it's a very strong spiritual number. So I ask if you wish to participate, then please close your eyes, sit straight with your spine straight so that your seven energy centers are in line. And we're going to breathe deeply. We're going to allow the chime to go around us, over us and through us. And while we're there, we're, we're concentrating and thinking of meditating upon appreciation and gratitude to the all that is within all of us. We have the same quality, but not the same quantity. To the ancestors we called into this space and also into the, uh, the principles and powers that underlie all existence that are not outside of us, but within us. And we ask that they take it from this realm, the third and fourth dimension, to the fifth dimension, where they can assist us with our intentions, and assist us with liberating ourselves, you know, and using information of the type that MZ Cecil kindly shared with us today. So I'm now going to ring. So breathe deeply, allow the vibration to connect i begin. Moja. Bailey. Tatu. In there. Tana. Sita. Saba. And so finally, we are going to now to use our intention to speak the words of power and the words of affirmation that are on the screen. So just follow with me, follow after me. 
Nguvu Zote. Nguvu Zote. Kwa Wata Wetu. Kwa Wata Wetu. Na Mapenzi Ya Wote. Na Mapenzi Ya Wote. Ni Mapenzi Yetu. Ni Mapenzi Yetu. All power to our people and the will of the all is our will. Asante Nisana, Jama. Thank you very much, Kindred. Okay, uh, Santa Sana to Dogo Imani, and again, hey, uh, big welcome. Santa Sana to Elder Cecil for this um, presentation today. So until next week, we'll be back again with a very interesting uh, presentation. So until next week, I bid you quite hearing.